All right, ladies and gentlemen, let the festivities begin. Um, for those of you I haven't met, I'm David Chalantano. I'm really pleased to have you all here today, especially for some of you who came a long way. Um, and you'll all get a chance to let Ken know when you get here. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, former Dean Somer and current Dean <laughs> McKenzie for joining us. Uh, faculty, students, staff, friends, and most importantly, the Nelson clan. Uh, I'm really pleased to welcome you to this continuing uh, series of seminars and presentations uh, to celebrate the centennial year of the Department of Epidemiology. Now, you might say, why? What? Huh? Didn't we do that already? Well, the school was formed in 1916, but the first class didn't uh, matriculate until 1919. So this is our 100th year as a department. And uh, Wade Hampton Frost was uh, the first faculty member uh, who was uh, hired and was the initial chair. And I must say, it's sort of humbling to realize that in the last 100 years, I'm only the seventh chair. Wow, scary. Uh, so uh, this year, we're honoring four of our most incredible epidemiologists who have really made landmark contributions to the discipline. So for those of you who have been coming, uh, we have so far honored Professors Moises Sklo, who is here with us today, and Kay Dickerson. And the final honoree in April will be uh, Michelle Ibrahim, who is also with us today. Uh, we also hosted um, an enormously successful day and a half symposium in November on the status of epidemiology. It was really well attended. And we brought together chairs and deans from many of the leading schools of public health in the US. Today, we celebrate our third honoree in recognition of the seminal contributions that he's made to infectious disease epidemiology, Kenrad Edwin Nelson. A little background, Ken graduated from DePaul University in 1954 and from Northwestern University School of Medicine in 1958. He then completed an internship in residency um, at Cook County Hospital in Chicago and then was uh, chief resident from 1962 and 63. And interestingly, his wife was one year behind him in the residency program. <laughs> Coincidence? Of course not. Uh, at that time, Cook County was the largest hospital in the United States, a massive uh, job. Ken then joined the EIS, the Epidemiologic Intelligence Service, uh, in Atlanta for two years, but he was assigned uh, to the Washington State Department of Health in Olympia. Afterwards, they returned to Chicago, where he was an epidemiologist for the Chicago Board of Health and was an ID consultant to the Chicago VA. Remember all this, Ken? Yeah. He joined the Department of Preventive Medicine and Community Health at the University of Illinois uh, Medical Center as an assistant professor in 1967. Yes, many of you were not even a twinkle at that point. <laughs> And he was promoted to associate professor in 1971 and full professor in 1977. We recruited Ken to our infectious disease epidemiology program in 1986, when he was appointed as professor in support of our growing HIV AIDS portfolio under Frank Polk's leadership. OK, enough about Ken. Let's talk about me. <laughs> Seriously, I attribute most of my so-called uh, success to the incredible mentoring and good luck that I've received during my time here at Hopkins. First, I was truly lucky to have done my doctoral dissertation research with George Comstock in Washington County. It was an extraordinary experience. Um, next, as a fledgling assistant professor, and I'm talking really fledgling, um, I had the opportunity to work for five years with Sam Shapiro. Uh, Sam Shapiro was the architect of the health insurance plan um, randomized trial that demonstrated the efficacy of screening mammography for uh, breast cancer and reduced breast cancer mortality. Um, then came the HIV epidemic, which brought Frank Polk, who was newly recruited to Hopkins from the Channing Lab at, Hop uh, at Harvard. Uh, he brought me into HIV research and began my journey in infectious disease research. 
Finally, the, probably to my mind, the most Im important to me was Ken, with whom I've been working since 1986. That's a few years. I think it's 33. It's a long time. Um, now, importantly, we're going to set the stage. Ken was a visiting professor of medicine and in the Department of Preventive and Social Medicine at the Faculty of Medicine, Chiang Mai University in northern Thailand from 1973 to 1975. A consortium of Midwest uh, universities exchanged faculty uh, with academic physicians in Thailand, and Ken had the opportunity to go to Chiang Mai for two years. He moved his family to Chiang Mai and added Tita while they were there uh, and had quite the time there, making lifelong friends and research collaborations. What has this got to do with anything, I hear you ask? Well, in 1990, Ken was contacted by a former uh, colleague uh, from Chiang Mai when the results of the first HIV sentinel surveillance uh, showed an explosive ep epidemic of HIV in the north. Ken was asked to come to Chiang Mai to advise the Ministry of Public Health on how to re how to respond to this situation. Um, and Ken told them that he would agree to come if he could bring his behavioral colleague, that would be me, um, as well. And that began our, our joint work, our collaboration with Chiang Mai University, again for Ken, but initially for me. Um, and you're soon going to hear about this from Chris Byrer. Um, this experience has been really transformative to my career um, and I think also opened up a number of opportunities for many of you in this uh, lecture hall. I couldn't be more grateful to Ken for his friendship, partnership, and mentorship. Kevin nev Ken never met a man or a meal that he didn't like. <laughs> but that's really not exuberant enough. You really have to say he truly has loved every experience he's had in his life. And it's amazing that it rolls off on all of us near him. Now, the road from BWI to CNX, that's Chiang Mai for those of you in IATA parlance, um, it was a long way. BWI, Detroit, Narita, Bangkok, Chiang Mai. Well, we did this trip four to six times a year, and we would be there for two to three weeks at a time. Uh, suffice it to say, I got to know Ken really, really well. We had breakfast together. We had lunch together. We had drinks and dinner together. So this really brought me to his family and growing up with Ken's family. Um, I knew what Karen was doing at the health department. Who were the new boyfriends? Uh, who's got a new job? And eventually, all the grandchildren, right? Ken was always enthusiastic about all of his family, and he reveled in their exploits. Uh, it's a pleasure to see the family here today. Thank you all for coming. Um, and to celebrate Ken's accomplishments, and I hope you feel the love that's in this room. Um, Ken has made an incredible um, uh, effect on all of us. Let me stop here. I'm going to introduce the four speakers who are going to give remarks uh, about Ken. I'll introduce them all now so we can keep the flow going, so they'll just pass the baton one to the next. When, what, when Ken was recruited here, Dave Vlahoff was a PhD student. Uh, he was working with Frank Polk on, de on developing the ALIVE study. And after the tragic early death of uh, Frank, um, Dave took over the ALIVE study and Ken was really at his right hand. Uh, today, Dave is professor and associate dean for research at the Yale School of Nursing, and Dave's going to talk about the early years here at Hopkins. Next up will be Chris Byrer. When Ken and I got our first funding uh, to do a cohort study of military conscripts for HIV, uh, we realized we really, really needed a field director. Uh, Chris had just completed his preventive medicine residence, residency. He was living on a Native American reservation somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And we got in touch with him, and like two weeks later, we were interviewing him in Chiang Mai. And he said, OK, this feels like a good fit. And he moved there four weeks later. <laughs> Who would have thought? Um, it really, he was there for four and a half years and has been an active participant with us ever since. So the rest is history. 
Now, Ken is a polymath of infectious diseases. He really is an encyclopedia of the literature. I mean, he knows every article from 1947 forward. And he could, at one point, always retrieve it from the immense piles in his office. It was remarkable. He always knew where it was. We're cleaning up his office right now. Um, he began a lot of studies on hepatitis virus, among all the other kinds of things that he did. Um, and his work, some of his initial work was accomplished with his doctoral student, Alain Lebrique. So Alain is our third presenter, and he's Associate Professor of International Health here at the school. Ken was legendary for his mentoring. Many of his former mentees are in this room today. So I think you'll all have a chance to get to him. Finally, I will lastly introduce Justin Lessler. Justin's an associate professor in the ID Epi program, and he focuses on ID dynamics and mathematical modeling. Justin is going to make some remarks about Ken and his teaching prowess, among other things. And just to give you an idea about Justin, Justin was the first student that I really pulled out all the stops to get him to come here to our doctoral program. He was working at IBM Research in, in California, where he was an engineer, and I'm glad to say it worked. So, Dr. Vlahoff, you're up. Is that right there. Right there. Right there. Right there. Up. Oh, no, no, no. Here, let me do it. Let me do it. Okay. <sighs> Ken, it's really great to see you and uh, also very much to see the family as well. It's uh, really an honor to be able to have this session and to be able to present uh, a little bit of uh, the experience that we had. <clears throat> so when I got here in uh, 1984 as a student, the AIDS epidemic was just getting uh, rolling, right? It was aware, but it was uh, really building at that point. And Frank Polk came here, and one of the things that was happening is the work was coming in faster than the institution could create the space for it to happen. And so there were uh, a small number of us in very compact space having to work different shifts in order to be able to get the work done, right? I'm leaving now, the next person's coming in to do the data and so forth. So in this context, Frank uh, really saw that he needed to be able to get some more help and to uh, really see this uh, expanding. So Frank had a number of people who were young, like myself at the time, and uh, doctoral students very much engaged with what was going on. And I remember the day uh, Ken came in for an interview, and he was sitting in a chair waiting for the interview, and I'm sitting there thinking, that's my father, <laughs> right? I mean, and, you know, and I don't know how to... Uh, to take this, he's such a nice guy, and you know, so enthusiastic about what uh, is going on. And he came on, and he became really an uncle, a mentor, a friend, a guide to all of us that worked with him uh, throughout the years here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Alive Study. That's what I've been uh, asked to do. And I hope uh, I do this. There we go. So in 1988, 1989, we had the job of going out and recruiting uh, injection drug users who mostly were not in treatment to be able to see them every six months, uh, at that point up to five years, to uh, identify risk factors for HIV infection and progression to AIDS. That was it, right? It was a pretty... Uh, straightforward kind of uh, experience. So in 13 months, 
We got 2,900 injection drug users, very active 90% in the past year, quite a few very active in the past month, uh, although only a small proportion were in drug abuse treatment. And so how was it that we were uh, going to move in terms of being able to have people come back? And so there were a number of procedures that we put in place and uh, again, a lot of discussion, bringing together experience of the team in order to do that. Now, over time, uh, you can see that the number of participants increased. We had a number of visits. This only goes to 2008. And Shruti Mehta, uh, really with uh, Greg Kirk, have followed this cohort since that time. And so they, at some point, are going to give a presentation about really the expansion of the ALIVE study. So I won't go through all the numbers here, but you can see they're pretty big, right? This was a very productive study, and publications at uh, 2008 were 314. Uh, I'm sure it's double that now, at least. So the um, Eight of us were the ones that originally started, and there were three people that were in the clinic at that point, two in the data house. Anyway, so you can see that this uh, expanded, where we had 29 faculty from public health, 14 from uh, the medical school, 45 students and fellows that had come through. And again, this was something that became so big and rich, and we moved from just studying HIV risk factors and progression uh, on into a whole uh, variety of uh, topics. <laughs> and so the ALIVE study core is at the top, and then ALIVE 2. Originally, we were funded only to see the seropositives, and all the people who were not uh, HIV positive were supposed to just let them go. And we said, well, that, you know, even though we're not funded to do that, let's bring that in. Let's just keep having them come back because that's going to be so important. And that was really Ken's idea. And Ken became uh, really the leader of, of that cohort being able to come back. Those studies together uh, really spawned a number of different studies, right? So we started to look at not only uh, HIV, but hepatitis and Again, Ken was very instrumental in being able to have the connections and also uh, uh, the enthusiasm to be able to make that happen. And the other thing that doesn't come across is not only would he initiate things, he would also pass them on to others, right? So you hear about Dave Thomas and the excellence that he has in uh, hepatitis overall. Again, a lot of that work uh, started in the ALIVE study, and it was really, excuse me, Ken uh, that, that really initiated the contacts and the original testing uh, to be able to make that happen. There are a number of other examples that we could give where Ken really was the seed that, or at least the fertilizer, to be able to, uh, <laughs> to be able to expand into all these other areas. Now, in one area of HIV prevention, we were looking at uh, developing the questionnaire at the beginning of the study, right? And so there are many, you know, how often do you use drugs and, you know, sex and so forth like that. But we went through medical history. And so there was a group of us sitting around the room and what should we include and exclude and so forth. So we were looking at HIV positives versus negatives. And so we would look at heart disease and kidney and respiratory and on down the list on the left. And then Ken said uh, diabetes. And the rest of us were sitting there thinking, let's see, endocrine and HIV. You know, we just couldn't like wrap our head around it. So we said, you know, we're really limited in terms of the amount of space we have for this questionnaire. How serious is, you know, we got to make some trade-offs here. And he was pretty insistent, uh, you know, that this would be uh, something that we should really keep our eye on. And knowing him as a person who knew all the literature and was the human Google at that time that, uh, you know, I so, said, okay, we'll leave it in there. So there was uh, the period of time where what is it that we were going to do to prevent HIV infection? And in uh, 1984, there was discussion of uh, needle exchange. And so there had to be evidence for that, right? And uh, 
there was a federal ban on uh, availability of needle exchange programs. And turned out we couldn't even do research on it, right? Because the regulations were, uh, there's a ban until the Surgeon General determines that there's sufficient evidence to show effectiveness and safety and so forth. But then at that same time, there was a notice that went out through the federal agencies that said you can't use federal money to study about whether these are effective, right? So the hands are tied. So now what we're doing is trying to figure out are there ways to show that it works or doesn't work? And Ken uh, came up with this as the analysis, and it's diabetics, uh, HIV is 10%, non-diabetic, 24%. And so, again, I don't know about you, but I was still sitting there thinking, oh, well, let's see, insulin. I said, no, it was unrestricted access to sterile needles, right? So he presented that in the San Francisco meeting in 1990, and just the buzz in the audience around that time, what genius this was to have brought this together, right? And, of course, everybody was congratulating me at that point, and uh, I didn't, you know, disabuse them of that, but no. <laughs> but the paper then got written up and it went to JAMA. And I, you'll remember this, the reviews came back and they said, you know, what's this have to do with insulin and blah, blah, blah. And said, no, no. So we talked to uh, the editor at that point, as I remember it. And uh, they, they got it, the paper came out and it was a big hit. Around that time, what were the other kinds of evidence that were coming out? And uh, Kaplan and Heimer up at Yale uh, did something kind of neat, which was to look at what's the circulation time of syringes that are out in the community. So they tagged syringes going out and then tagged them when they're coming back. And so how long, this, presumably the shorter they're out in circulation, less likely they are to be HIV. And so this was the kind of modeling that they were doing. That was about it for that time in terms of uh, building the evidence. But it was enough to move the conversation. And eventually, the ban on doing the studies um, uh, was lifted. So the work that uh, Ken really uh, was a pioneer with, I have to say, led to uh, needle exchange at state levels, and this is uh, the bill from Maryland, there are ones from other states, and just the influence that his work has had, and that's the Baltimore Needle Exchange. Uh, and again, looking at the ALIVE study as the PI at that time of the uh, HIV negative cohort, what was the incidence? And you'll see around the time that needle exchange started, around 1994, but really getting off in 95 and 96, uh, we're also seeing a big decrease in HIV incidence. Don't want to attribute it all to needle exchange. There were a lot of things that were going on for comprehensive uh, HIV prevention. But again, the impact that Ken had on us individually with his mentoring uh, and also the science that he delivered um, made, made a big difference. So Ken, thank you. Well, uh, wonderful to be here, Ken. So good to see you back where you belong in this place, and uh, Karen and the family. Um, I have the really the distinct pleasure uh, and honor of speaking about um, the years and the impact and what I'm going to call the virtuous cycle of research into policy and practice and into public health impact uh, of these years uh, in Chiang Mai, Thailand. Uh, when Ken uh, was such an essential person, really, as the leader of the Hopkins Chiang Mai University collaboration. Um, so Chiang Mai is a pretty beautiful place. 
Uh, it actually means the new city. It was built by the king of Chiang Rai for his grandson uh, about 730 years ago. We managed to all be there, uh, David Celentano, Ken, myself, uh, for the 700th anniversary, which was pretty uh, magical. Um, I had never been to Thailand, and I'd never heard, really, of Chiang Mai uh, when Ken interviewed me uh, for the position. And for those of you who had the experience of being interviewed for a position by Ken Nelson, you know that basically uh, he makes it easy because he just did all the talking. <laughs> and he told me all about Chiang Mai, and by the time we were done with the call, I hadn't really gotten to say much about who I was or what I was interested in, but I was sold. Uh, there, was, <laughs> there was no question I was going to go there. Um, and, of course, there was a very important reason for all of us to be there, and that is that uh, the HIV epidemic, uh, we gradually understood after those early years in the United States that this was a global pandemic, uh, that it was affecting every region of the world, uh, and that South and Southeast Asia were turning out to be very much uh, a part uh, the second most affected region in the world after Sub-Saharan Africa. So this is an old slide from UNAIDS that shows you in 1986 where we were, which was essentially uh, there was no HIV or measurable HIV in the region. Uh, and then by 91, the blue color that's lighting up there is Thailand. Thailand had the most a really explosive, uh, the first well-documented epidemic in the region. Uh, by 96, it was getting over the 2%, up to close to 3% of reproductive age adults. So that was then considered to be the most severe epidemic in the region. Uh, and by 2001, unfortunately, it was joined by a number of its neighbors. <coughs> So, uh, as you heard from David, 1992 was the funding of the first NIH-funded international cohort studies to prepare for AIDS vaccines. This was called the PAVE, the Preparation for AIDS Vaccine Evaluation Studies. And at the time, so 1992, the efficacy trial for HIV vaccines was supposed to be two years away. That, that, that has never changed. <laughs> it's always two years away. Uh, we're still chasing it, but nevertheless, uh, we had, uh, Ken and David had successfully gotten this funding, um, and uh, the idea was to establish actually a series of cohorts, including cohorts with the Royal Thai Army, uh, which has a semi-random sample of 21-year-olds. So from the perspective of uh, uh, epidemiology, this was a very special and uh, fascinating population. These are some of the folks who played key roles, and there, with Ken and myself, uh, as a much younger person, um, is Dr. Chavalit, who was the head of the CDC, the Ministry of Public Health for Thailand, for Northern Thailand, and Dr. Sukhan, who doesn't look like an army colonel, but he was. And uh, he was the head of the Royal Thai Army Medical Corps for Northern Thailand. So that was the kind of the core of our collaboration. And I just have to acknowledge that um, when we started to present some of that science, uh, one of our colleagues who now is a very distinguished virologist here in the United States, Sodsai Tavana Butra, uh, is there in that slide. And so lovely to see you here. Um, nice to have somebody from Chiang Mai. Mm -hmm. So the virtuous cycle that I referred to, um, some of you may be familiar with this, is identification of a public health problem, a description of the epidemiology, often from surveillance, Risk factor analysis, so really trying to understand what are the drivers. Uh, using that risk factor analysis to develop interventions to target the risks for acquisition and transmission uh, and treatment. And then policy formulation and public health impact. So that is the goal, and it doesn't always happen that you actually get to see that whole cycle uh, completed. But in the case of Ken's work in Thailand, we can say, Emphatically, yes. So, of course, this is the beginning of the HIV epidemic, as everybody knows, and the lovely woman there in the corner who discovered the HIV virus in 1983, Francois Barry Sinoussi. And this is the very first report of HIV in Thailand. So, if you Google HIV in Thailand, this is the uh, PubMed, it, this is the first paper that comes up. Not by our group, I'm sorry to say. Um, but nevertheless, and at the time, it actually was being called HTLV3 slash LAV, right? That's how early this is. Uh, and the language is a little bit dated. We don't call people male homosexual prostitutes anymore. Uh, but that is where uh, the virus was first identified. 
So we really began in that first step of the, uh, of the virtuous cycle, establishing these cohorts and starting to do descriptive epidemiology studies. And I've just highlighted in blue uh, where Ken is, uh, not all of these early papers, but many of them. And they include, for example, reports from the cohort evaluations, uh, preparatory studies for vaccine trials, uh, the first paper on same-sex behavior as a risk for Thai men, uh, and then I remember memorably at one point Ken and David were doing one of their trips out and Ken said to me, you know, it's a virus. We need a virologist. Uh, and uh, that was a good idea. And then we brought out a virologist and it turned out that the virology was really fascinating. Uh, and so we did a series of virology papers with uh, Yu Zhaofang, who was a virologist here. And then also looking at some of the other populations, including really the first ever assessment of the tribal uh, ethnic minorities, the hill tribe people uh, in northern Thailand. And then we started to get more into the risk factors and being able to measure incidents and looking at risks for incident infection. And it turned out that um, at least at the time, the bulk of these transmissions were due to heterosexual transmission and mostly within a commercial axis. So soldiers and young men uh, having high, over 90% uh, visitation and, and uh, sexual relationships with sex workers. And so that turned out to be a very, very important part of our focus and also the focus of the Thai program. Uh, so there are a number of papers there. Um, and this really led to uh, something very remarkable. So you, you have to remember at this time, this is pre-treatment. None of the, none of, nobody living with HIV infection is getting treated at this period, um, even though 1996 was the beginning of triple therapy in, in the first world, but in developing countries there was really no treatment. Uh, we did not have any other preventive tools except behavior change, condoms, and sexually transmitted infection treatment. So it's not a very powerful armamentarium, and yet in Thailand it began to really have some bite. And so the, the very first paper that showed that actually there were changes in sexual behavior and declines in infection was this one led by Ken in the New England Journal. This is a great title, Changes in Sexual Behavior and a Decline in HIV Infection. How often does that happen? Uh, and this is really what it looked like. So we had this unique situation, and this was another one of Ken's really brilliant insights, that the Royal Thai Army recruits 21-year-olds uh, in a semi-random sample. And what, what that means basically is it's the lower 80% of SES. So wealthier people can pay their way out of it. Everybody else is recruited. And they're recruited in exactly the way that Alexander the Great recruited for his army, black and white marbles which is the way that you do that fairly for people who are illiterate. They can see that, you know, you get one color, you're in, you get the other color, you're going home back to the farm. Uh, so these are a very precious population. What you're looking at here is not a cohort of men, but rather every year is another group of 21-year-olds. So you're looking at serial birth cohorts over time recruited the same way. And what you can see is 91 is, is uh, really was a, a very severe period in the epidemic. Over 10% of young men coming into this army were HIV infected. That was the highest rate ever <coughs> reported in Asia, and it's never been repeated. Uh, and then 93 was the peak, close to 12% of men. And then this really quite remarkable decline, and within a decade, under 1%. So this is what it looked like for the country, and just to say that Chiang Mai is in the upper north, and it, you can see very clearly this was extraordinarily concentrated right where we were. So the whole country was seeing these declines, but it was really spectacular where we were. So the next really series of papers were through that period and understanding what was happening, uh, documenting it. Uh, and also trying to understand what these men were doing to reduce their sexual risks. And it was really interesting. It turned out there was a lot of self-treatment and prophylaxis going on for STIs, uh, a community-led kind of pre-exposure prophylaxis. We did a study of used condoms, and it turns out that men were using two and three condoms. Right? That is uniquely Thai, but uh, it appeared to have an impact. Um, and, uh, and then very importantly, we did see spectacular declines in sexually transmitted infections. Uh, but this really also led us to intervention research, and that's where having a behavioral scientist on board like 
David Celentano matter so much. This was uh, the first big intervention that we did with uh, Thai Army recruits, uh, and it was a successful preventive intervention to reduce STIs uh, among these men. So this is some data actually from the Ministry of Health and the World Bank, but what you can see here is the, the red curve is the increase in condom use, reported condom use among soldiers, getting up, as you can see, close to 100%. And the name of this campaign was the 100% condom campaign, yeah, and uh, it actually worked. Uh, and then that is the diagnoses, reported diagnoses of sexually transmitted infections coming into the ministry, and that actually is a log decline from 250,000 a year to, uh, to about 25,000 a year. So really quite spectacular. There was also a lot of clinical work going on. I couldn't talk about Ken's impact in Chiang Mai without showing you the bamboo rat. That's what that is. That is an intermediate host for the dimorphic uh, fungus, uh, Penicillium marnefii. And when we started, uh, and I used to go on rounds in the hospitals with Ken, um, he would go with the ID docs. The wards were full of Thai people with this terrible infection, penicillosis, which you can see there. Uh, that's what it looks like, this dimorphic yeast. And it was an opportunistic infection for which this animal was an intermediate host, and they are actually eaten in northern Thailand. Uh, and Ken began working with mycologists, people interested in funguses, the clinical trial folks, WHO got involved, uh, and very quickly a clinical trial was established uh, that discovered that itraconazole, an antifungal, was extremely effective for treating this disease. Now you don't see it. Uh, it is really quite remarkable. So I just wanted to share one virtual, uh, you know, uh, virtuous cycle. Um, but the epidemic started to change. We'd had great success with sexual behavior change and condoms, and then emerging was uh, an epidemic among people who inject drugs. And of course, fortunately, both Ken and David had a lot of expertise in this area. We did a lot of work in this. We uh, had a NIDA grant to establish a cohort and look at uh, not only uh, heroin injection, but also methamphetamine use. Um, it turns out this was a bit of a blind spot for the ties. This is their national data on uh, HIV among drug users. And anybody see that same spectacular decline? So uh, unfortunately, still an ongoing problem uh, with limits on harm reduction and methadone. Uh, and still, of course, next to Burma, which is remains, or Myanmar, uh, the second largest producer of illicit opiates in the world after Afghanistan. So Chiang Mai is down there in the northern top of Thailand, and those dark red areas are the highest density uh, cultivation zones for opium in the world after Afghanistan. So I want to just talk now about the policy impacts of all of this work um, and these uh, very important studies and papers uh, that Ken led. So uh, I was part of a, a team for the World Bank that evaluated Thailand's response and we're trying to replicate it in other, in other countries. Uh, and this was an assessment of basically what were the elements of success that allowed Thailand to get control of that sexual transmission epidemic. The very first was epidemiologic surveillance. So for you epidemiology students, that's meant to be empowering. Hope it is. Uh, a broad multi-sectoral dialogue that was real. A massive public awareness campaign. 100% condom campaign focused in the sex industry. Big increases in public spending. I'll show you that in a minute. And active international research collaborations, including ours uh, and a number of others. Um, this is what the condom distribution looked like. So in 1988, the government was giving away, uh, you know, a reasonable number, a little under 10 million, uh, and that went up uh, a log to 60 million. And I think it's very important to say this was in the days before things like the Global Fund and PEPFAR. There really wasn't that much money in HIV, uh, but this is one country among very few that put its own money into this. So that dark blue is, is international donor funds for the HIV response, and that lavender color is what the ties were kicking in. So that made a huge difference, and that was really driven by uh, science and by data. And I want to just, just bring this to a close by saying there then was a, a, an assessment of the Thai response. This was a modeling piece from the Thai Working Group on AIDS, so it's not our group, so I'm happy to say it's unbiased. But think about this. That is the trajectory in red that Thailand was on 
And the yellow line is what actually happened to HIV uh, incidents in the country. And the estimate is that that vigorous Thai response, the research, the collaboration, the evidence-based approach, averted five million HIV infections. So for that, Ken, uh, the Thai people owe you uh, uh, eternal gratitude, as do all the rest of us. And that, to me, is really uh, just a profound example. You know, we have a little mantra around here about saving lives millions at a time. It actually happens. <laughs> And in recognition of that, of course, uh, Ken uh, was awarded uh, an honorary doctorate from Chiang Mai University. Uh, Karen came out for that ceremony. You can see our Army Colonel, Dr. Sakon, is there. Um, the man standing next to Karen, Dr. Tira, is the guy who led the work on penicillosis uh, and was PI of the itraconazole trial. Dr. Tira, who was later the director of the institute and a lifelong uh, friend of Ken and Karen's. And uh, that degree was uh, awarded to Ken by the late King Rama IX, uh, the king of Thailand, and uh, richly, deeply deserved. We always say in, in this field, we, we stand on the shoulders of giants, and I think today's one of those clear examples where that's true. I'd like to start by uh, inviting students and mentees of Ken's who are in the room to kindly just stand up for a moment. So if you were a student or mentee of, of Ken, I think that, that's really... So as one of the proud uh, students and mentees of, of this, this giant of our field, um, it's, it's really a privilege for me to be representing so many of us and, and, uh, and what Ken means to, to, to those, of, those of us who he mentored over the years. As we go through life, we, uh, the people we meet not only shape us, but, but help us grow and become who we are. And each of us can hardly be, des be described by, by one person's reflections, but we can piece together the whole man uh, through reflections of each facet of a person's life. So Ken Nelson has been for, for over two decades a mentor, a guide, a sounding board, a father figure, and, and a really close friend. Um, and, and he's been that for so many of us, as we've heard in the past few remarks. He was my academic advisor <clears throat> for both my master's and my doctoral work in the epi department when I came to Johns Hopkins in 1997. His class on infectious diseases was the one that lit that fire in my, in my brain and gut, and that was my aha moment when I understood why I came to Johns Hopkins. And it was in the very early days at JHU that I came to learn about his, uh, his adventures as an EIS officer, you know. In his work, from the very beginning, he exemplified this, this emblem of the EIS, and that is the, the hole in the shoe, not by sitting in his office or, or um, in a global health agency making policy, which he could have done very early in his career, but by hunting down answers in the field to these big questions. And he knew that was where the action was. And as, as you pointed out, David, like that was the, the zest for everything that he took on was exemplified by uh, his work. So the best vantage point is what he taught us, was being in the field where you could be face to face with the bugs that you were exploring. In listening to his lectures, it was hard to believe that one man, uh, his beloved Karen and growing family in tow, could have covered so much ground in the time that, uh, that he's had to work. Having been through the equivalent of multiple careers in just one career, from leprosy to hepatitis E, Ken is a recognized global authority in the, with real world experience to boot. And he didn't just write the textbook on infectious diseases, he wrote many of them. And having spent uh, my early life in the field working with, with leprosy, I knew from the start that we were off on a, on a good foot. So from unpacking the mysteries of uh, hepatitis E 
to mentoring students in Thailand, Nepal, and Bangladesh, we had more adventures than I can count. And uh, I think where David uh, Celentano left off, I took over accompanying David, uh, accompanying Ken from, from airport to airport and getting to know him, I think, almost more intimately than I'd like to, uh, to admit. Um, you know, who else would send his young students directly out to Nepal to explore pig poop? Um, anyone from OSHA, please look away from this slide. Uh, I am wearing very transparent gloves, I assure you. But in thinking of a word to describe uh, the facet of Ken that, that I have been the most privileged to observe, it's without a doubt uh, passionate. Lukewarm science was never good enough for, for Ken. Whether in science or life, Ken has always been trepidatious, uh, ne never been trepidatious. It's either jump in with, with both feet or not at all. So when I first walked into his office uh, as a, a doe-eyed epi master student uh, in the 1990s, um, I was asking the ever patient uh, Barbara Gray um, for an appointment with Ken. I had to duck the flying phone that came out of his office, uh, giving new meaning to, to cordless phones at the time. But a uh, uh, grant had just been denied uh, to him, uh, causing some consternation. So he looked me in the eye and he said, hey, there's an emerging interesting virus, uh, hepatitis E. Do you, want to, to, do you want to get in on this? And you know, my first question, even to this day, is a common question that we get. And it's, uh, what is E, hepatitis E? And boy, was I going to find out. <laughs> um, and that was the beginning of my working with him. Ken's career had been prolific, as this network diagram from our, uh, our Hopkins system shows. Uh, just he's worked with, with almost everyone under this roof and, and under the sun. But I'm really proud that over the past 20 years, he and I have published together more than 35 papers, chapters, and reports together um, on hepatitis E and helped to grow this next generation of disease hunters in this noble tradition. I only have two Davids to compete with, both Celentano and Thomas, who have probably exceeded me in, uh, in these collaborations. So he began my training with a strategy that I still use to this day, getting me to write a literature review to figure out not what was known about hepatitis E, but for me to identify what was not known about this disease. It was a very Zen moment from Star Wars, you know? Don't see the net, young grasshopper. See the holes in the net. <laughs> and we published that literature review with a colleague uh, right here, John Tyshurst, who was a giant in the field at the time, who began as a reviewer of this paper and absolutely tore it up. And then he liked the paper so much that we got him to zero convert to the writer's side, and he joined us as an, as an author. And to this day, it remains one of the most highly cited HEV uh, reviews. Then we began developing a research agenda. It took one and a half years while serving as a TA and an RA to EPI courses, and writing 19, I repeat, 19 failed grants until we held in our hands a two and a half million dollar a hepatitis E NIH R01 to describe, as he had done with uh, HIV, in detail the epidemiology of this emerging pathogen and its consequences in pregnancy in rural Bangladesh. This became a series of consecutive studies covering over a decade and three sites across Bangladesh and Nepal. Now I pause here to tell a cautionary tale of following instructions. <laughs> Back in the dark ages, many of us remember, long before COES, when, when R01s were submitted in hammer mill paper boxes, hundreds of papers copied eight times and uh, delivered by FedEx to NIH's doorstep. We submitted this R01 for which we had worked nearly for eight months, getting it perfect. And then months went by with no word from the NIH. And we were wondering, maybe it's got lost in the mail. We gave them a call and only to find out, oh, we're sorry, your grant wasn't reviewed. It was rejected. Why? Because we had right justified the abstract. <laughs> there were a few sentences in that introductory paragraph that were 18 characters per inch, and we were only allowed 12. Ken, as you can imagine, was livid. <laughs> I was in tears, and I think the phone on which we made the call to the NIH lost its life uh, that day as well. 
I was supposed to be starting my field work uh, by November of that year, and the dean and associate deans uh, went to bat for us. I, Al, Al is here in the audience, and you know, I remember many phone calls to NIH saying, guys, this is a, a bean counting issue, come on. And uh, they weren't budging. Rules were rules. So we buckled up like good epidemiologists do and resubmitted. Within six months, we heard back and we had a one percentile score. So anything is possible. Uh, uh, the best score possible, and it was a tragedy or triumph, uh, you decide. But you can bet that neither can or I right justify anything ever again. <laughs> But in the field was where you saw Ken in his element. He loved nothing more than being in the hottest, sweatiest, muddiest environment solving these epi problems. As we began to find out more and more about this pernicious and complex virus, our outrage began to grow. The major cause of pregnancy-related mortality was now vaccine preventable. But little headway was being made to, to introduce this vaccine to control the growing number of epidemics caused by HIV around the world. Our group's data began to be presented around the world. Solid epi data demonstrating widespread infection, poor long-term protection from natural exposure, and previously under-recognized hepatitis E even in the US complemented by the work of many mentors here in the room who helped to grow this evidence base around uh, hepatitis E. Ken was hell-bent on making sure that we not only did good science, but also moved HEV out of the shadows. After 30 years, a virus should no longer be referred to as emerging. We used to joke that hepatitis E was so neglected, it was left off the list of emerging trop uh, neglected tropical diseases. So finally, in 2013, the WHO moved it to being a low-priority disease, despite tens of thousands of cases and likely deaths each year. And this was cause for celebration for all of us, uh, where in 20, until 2012, it wasn't even assigned a priority whatsoever. So these are the kind of things that excite us epidemiologists. We began advocating for the use of the now-demonstrated efficacious Chinese vaccine, especially after the 2015 Nepal earthquake, suggesting that we could save nearly 2,000 pregnancy-related deaths in Nepal by targeted vaccination. Ken argued loudly and convincingly that measures had to be taken to not only allow this vaccine to be used, but to encourage its use in pregnant women from HIV-related mortality in epidemics documented across the global south. In the meantime, I had long defended my thesis and was giving sage advice with fewer flying phones, hopefully, um, to our newest PhD students, Brittany Kamush and Lisa Crane, and the new faculty member uh, we helped recruit, Chris Heaney, to help continue to unravel the mysteries of hepatitis E. Uh, together with Ken and myself, they worked to demonstrate how assays were being used to test HEV were about 50% less sensitive than the newer assays, underestimating the global burden of disease quite significantly. So all of this was building the case for a definitive trial of the hepatitis E vaccine. What I learned from Ken is that lukewarm science is not enough. After five years of staring into a microscope, watching yeast divide before I came to Johns Hopkins, I wanted to bite into science and wrestle answers from it. And I found the Ernest Hemingway of infectious diseases. Here is the man who would grab the proverbial swordfish from the sea with his bare hands. Today, I ask each of my students after our first meeting to come back to me when they have found at least one thing that in their coursework or in their readings, which they cannot stand, for which the injustice is too great to bear the status quo and the, the current state of science is not good enough. I hope many of us remember the conversations with Ken where his intense passion for the topic, whether about politics, whether about a moving poem, a story about his amazing kids or grandkids, would, would move him to poorly hidden tears in his eyes. And still he never faltered but powered through that story. And that's the intensity that makes science change the world. We live in times where it's our moral obligation to speak out for good science, to pursue the best data to shift policies and save lives. And lukewarm science is not good enough. 
which is my inheritance from my mentor and friend, Ken Nelson. Thank you. Okay, this was a lot less intimidating before I heard those three talks. <laughs> we could all just go if you want. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I have, I have the honor of uh, talking about Ken's teaching. Um, and you know, Ken's, as has already been shown from uh, the other speakers, that teaching and mentorship is a real theme that has gone throughout uh, Ken's career. And you know, we, there's a there's a lot to cover. But I'm, I'm going to start with a um, a personal story. So uh, I used to be a boxer. I w I was pretty good. Um, I thought I could be really good. And then uh, one day I got in the ring with somebody who was like eighth in line to be have a world title shot. And even though it was sort of a you know friendly sparring session, it took me about five seconds to realize I was never going to be that good. <laughs> Not even close. And I had a pretty similar feeling the first time I sat down in Ken's office for a chat. <laughs> I, you know, I, I start talking about flu and Ken brings up some relevant research for about three decades ago and he goes through his papers and pulls out the relevant article and the relevant citation. And then I start talking about healthcare acquired infections and he looks and he, you know, says, oh, I, you know, something came out last week. And goes through papers and pulls it out and it seemed like nothing. He didn't know, and I had this sort of sinking feeling that I was going to be expected someday to have this knowledge of the literature, and I was pretty sure that was never going to happen. Um, and even though I have the great honor of having a position Ken had for 10 years as track director of the infectious disease epidemiology, I can assure you it did not happen. Um, but I tell the story not just because it highlights uh, Ken's breadth of knowledge, which has you know, been a benefit to many, many generations of students, uh, but because what it says about his dedication to teaching. I hadn't made an appointment, I had just shown up and knocked on Ken's door to ask a question. And he spent over, well over an hour talking to me and go, talking about my research and sharing the knowledge that he had accumulated over a long career um, to help me get the start of mine. Um, and I was just a random PhD student. And I, you know, I'm far from the only one, as, as has already been illustrated, who can tell stories about uh, the time and energy Ken has put to mentoring his students. And um, you know, Thailand's come up a lot now, and sometimes I feel like you don't really understand Ken's impact on students until you go to Thailand. Because you go through the Ministry of Health there, and they hear you're from Johns Hopkins. They're like, oh, do you know Ken Nelson? <laughs> and then when they find out that you, that you do, they ask of his health. They want you to send their regards. And it's really, really amazing. Um, but individual mentorship is, of course, not the only way Ken has affected students um, and taught students. Perhaps most notable is the many decades he spent um, teaching infectious disease epidemiology in the department. And I have a syllabus from uh, one of his early, um, early courses, I think 1925. <laughs> um, so uh, actually, we could only get back to 1996. That was Wade Hampton Frost. <laughs> um, so, and a uh, syllabus from uh, one of his uh, more recent courses. Um, and when you look at these, um, you really realize that Ken's teaching has both a consistency um, and an adaptability. Um, tried and true lectures are mixed with um, the most cutting edge disease issues of the day, um, all presented by a cast of all-star guest lecturers usually, but um, as Lilia Chesan tells us, those, who's TA'd for him for many years, um, those guest lecturers are not required. Um, she says that uh, Ken can give an excellent, here, I have to quote up here. <laughs> um, Ken can give an excellent lecture on one of, of a dozens of topics covered in class at the drop of a hat. This isn't hypothetical. On one memorable day, we had a guest lecturer who didn't show up to class. I was panicked. I thought we were going, going to have to cancel class, but I really needed an of worried. Dr. Nelson got right up and started to give the lecture. No prior preparation required. Very belatedly, the speaker appeared and gave the rest of the lecture. But it was clear, guest speakers are sufficient, 
but not necessary for students to receive a top-notch le top lecture in Dr. Nelson's class. Uh, st students continue to be impressed with Ken's class. Um, typical comments from um, recent course reviews was Dr. Nelson is incredibly knowledgeable and I feel lucky to have been one of his students. And I thought Dr. Nelson was wonderful. And I can tell he has a pa passion about this topic and has um, much experience in the field. Um, those who've taught with Ken have been equally impressed. Derek Cummings says, when I first started teaching with Ken, I was eager to contribute changes to the course to make my mark. I quickly realized how hard it was to change the course in a positive way. The backbone was strong. And as I tried to suggest changes, I realized Ken had thought through many of these perturbations before. And thinking back to some of those tried and true lectures, Emily Gurley, who now has the daunting task of uh, teaching this critical course, had this to say. Everyone will ever always remember his Rye syndrome and toxic shock syndrome case control studies. They're classics. I remember when I convinced him to give an overview of his career to class. He talked about when he first came to Hopkins and started teaching the ID Epi course. He said that he couldn't find a textbook that covered ID Epi well, so he made his own. Still used today. The man. The legend. <laughs> About that toxic sock syndrome lecture, um, Ken was never one to let a good slide go to waste. Um, I'm pretty sure that um, perhaps almost 30 years of students have seen this slide uh, as it's made its way from overhead projection to uh, PowerPoint. Um, but it's an amazing lecture, so <laughs> it's well worth it. Um, and we can't end without um, discussing Ken's book. Uh, now in its third edition, it is the lasting legacy that ensures Ken will uh, still be teaching students for years to come. Uh, you know, infectious disease epidemiology theory and practice remains one of the most important references on my bookshelf. And um, I, when he asked uh, Derek Cummings and me to uh, write a chapter for it, I still count that as one of the greatest honors of my entire career. And I think it always will be. Um, and I'm not the only one who likes it. It has 4.5 stars on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> and I love, this is, the first, this is the first review. This is not curated. This is the first review that comes up. And I love it. How many textbooks can you honestly say you'd enjoy curling up with and reading for pleasure? <laughs> Most are dry and sleeping to sing, while Dr. Nelson's text is as engaging as it is informative. The scope is broad and deep. If you buy only one book on infectious disease epidemiology, make it this one. So um, Ken, on behalf of all those who've had the opportunity to learn from you and be in your class over the years, I, I thank you. You've set an example to which we can most of us can only inspire, and um, a grift will treasure always. Thank you.